So the fall before I turned 13, my family moved from California to Oregon. And as part of that move, we made sure to pack very neatly one item. See, we had this family Bible that sat right in the coffee table nook. Right? And we needed to make sure we had it because that Bible, that's where we stored all the important information. Right? That was birth certificates, social security cards, everything that we needed to, any, to participate in anything, essentially, right? But, but we missed something in the transition, and, and something, something went missing that, that we kind of ended up needing, but as an older brother, I took a bit to my advantage. See, my sister wanted to play basketball, so she needed to submit a birth certificate so that they knew she was the right age. My parents went to the Bible, and they open it up, and they pull out the birth certificates, and guess what's not there? My sister's birth certificate. And because I love my sister, I pulled her aside, and I said, Rainy, um, Mom and Dad were going to wait to tell you this. <laughs> um, but, but I just, it's important that you know the reason we don't have your birth certificate is you're adopted. <laughs> and she was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, because we have pictures from me from when I was a baby. I'm like, yeah, they gave those to us. <laughs> yeah, but, but I look like you. No, it's just, it's because we're around each other so much, you start to act <laughs> like me. I was like, see, you're little, I'm big. Right? And she's like, no. And, and it just went on for a couple weeks. And she went to my parents and was like, am I really adopted? And my parents were like, you are not adopted. Who told you you were adopted? And I <laughs> shrugged off to the side. And my parents pulled me aside and said, Chris, do you see what this has done to your sister? It's like, what? She knows it's a joke. She didn't know it was a joke. I was like, but, but you get in that situation, you're like, let me pass off as much of this as I can. And she, and they go, no, look at what's, being, what's happening to her. She's lost. She doesn't know who she is. She keeps trying to figure out where she belongs. See, that's what happens, right? We lose identity. We lose a sense of who we are. And life starts to unravel. And we start to grasp at anything we can to figure out who we are or who we're supposed to be. Today, we get to a transition point in the book of Colossians. See, up to this point, Paul's talked to the church about the way they've interpreted their actions. He's talked to the church about how some people may have led them astray. How, you know, it, it started off as a great idea, but slowly these items have become the dogma of the world. But today he gets to a point where he goes, listen, guys, we can talk about these actions all we want, but, but at the heart of this, at the heart of everything, it's not about the action. It's about your identity. But see, identity wasn't just an issue in the church of Colossae, right? Because identity is something we deal with as humans, as a whole. Because we were created for one thing, and we become something completely different. We were created by design to walk with God in the garden, created to live within his creation, to see him, to move with him, to know his love in every aspect of who we are. But we get a little prideful. We want it a little bit for ourselves. We, we start to question whether or not we can do it our own way. And then lo and behold, we stand be before the forbidden fruit and take that first bite. And then, from that point on, that identity, that thing we were created for, that walking with God, is gone. 
we're separated from God because of our desire to want and to do things for ourselves. And when we get that separation, all of a sudden there's holes, right? Holes in our heart. Holes in our being that we're trying to fill with everything else. This week, I thought, this should be fun. And I uh, decided I was going to Google the, the phrase, walking with God in the Garden of Eden. Right? Here's, here's the first image that came up in this search. Evidently, God looks a little like Chris Christopherson with wings. <laughs> but, but, but you see what I see? I see a frustrated God. I see a serpent. And I see an Eve feeling distraught. You know what I don't see? Walking with God in the Garden of Eden. Well, but, but here's the second picture that, that came up. Oh. It's intense, right? This idea that we're separated from the garden. The angel standing there not allowing us back in to where we were created to be. I was like, this is getting interesting, right? None of this seems like walking with God. How about this next one? Hmm. The angel just casting out Adam and Eve. Okay, well, maybe one more. Angry angel frightened Adam and Eve. Took a lot of scrolling and searching, but I finally got to this. Hmm. Doesn't that one just feel different? Sit there and go, man, that's what we're created to be. Just in the presence of God shining down on us, living within his creation in peace. But, but here's, here's the problem, right? You do a search for walking in the Garden of Eden with God and you get images of despair. You get images of the fall. And it's because we spend so much time in our life searching for things to fill us that we lose track of what it's like to be with God. We have this desire and hope to live in a world like this, but we can't understand what that's like because we're separated from it. And at the center of this identity that we've created is ourself. We use that to dictate our values, our relationships, and our time. And when we interact with culture, we do it the same way. Right? We gain an understanding of personal value through our cultural relationships and influences. There's no steadiness in an identity like this. Right? It's flawed. Produces insecurity and, and desires for validation. And pretty soon, right, what did we do in response to that fall? We start to self-medicate with pleasure and desire and hope that can just quench us for the moment. Or, as C.S. Lewis coins it, we're left with an ever-craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure. This summer, we have been going through a series, right, called Walking in All Fullness with God. And today, we get to start Colossians 3, where Paul shares what's at the heart of this walk with God. So let's read those words together. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Or in other words, hey, your identity is in the wrong place. And you're trying to fill a void that's already been filled. See, when we look at Paul's words, there's no wavering, Right? Paul's not saying, well, you should probably be okay. 
He's not saying you should have a relationship with God, but you know, we really don't know what's going to happen in the end. No. Right? Paul's words are concrete. Since you believe, you've been raised from the dead with Christ. Since you believe, you were buried with Christ. Since you believe, you will be raised for eternity with Christ. It's concrete. There's no wavering. There's no questions. Guys, this is good news, right? See, but these verses, they challenge the Colossians just like they challenge us, right? We're forced to recognize who we are or, you know, where our value lies. Because society tells us we're valuable because we do things. Culture tells us we're valuable because we care for things, because we're able to achieve things. And Paul says, guess what? That's not where your value is. You're not valuable because you can do things or you know things. You're valuable because those things were already done. You're valuable because Christ died and was resurrected for you. But here's the key. We want it to be glamorous. And we want to be able to say, look what I've done. Look where I'm at. And Paul says, hey, it's not going to be glamorous. It's not who we're designed to be, but guess what? It's going to be fruitful. Those holes that are inside your heart, they're going to start to get filled. But you have a responsibility in that, right? Look at verse 1, right? Since you have been raised with Christ. It's not if you've been raised. It's not maybe you've been raised. Since you have been raised with Christ. Since you've been raised with Christ, what? Set your mind, her hearts on things above. Set your desires. Set your hopes. Set those things that you really want. They'll never be fulfilled in the world. Set, set them above. Where are we setting them above to? Because it's not just staring off at the sky going, ah, it's, you know, God's up there somewhere. So I just want God to take care of it. No. Set them on where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Why is this important? It's important because Christ is sitting at the right hand of God because his job's done. Right? He's not sitting there waiting to do something else. He's not sitting there going, oh, I hope Chris gets this done. I hope he can really figure it out and, you know, he can get through this sermon today. No. He's sitting there because the job is done. He's saying, Chris, you don't have to worry about it because no matter what you say, I already did it. Right? But your heart, your heart's what drives those desires. And it's that emptiness in your heart that you keep trying to fill with this ever diminishing pleasure of the world. And Paul's saying, hey, desires. Put them away. Put that quest aside because there's only one thing that can fill those desires. There's only one thing that ever has, and that's Jesus. So we put our hearts towards Christ, and the holes in our hearts start to heal, right? But it's more than our hearts and desires because Paul moves on in verse 2, and he says, hey, you've got to set your mind on things above, not unearthly things. It can't just be about your desires, right? It's got to be about your thoughts. It's got to be about all those things you're thinking about and focusing on and planning. Set those. Set those on heavenly things, things above. Because why? Because you died. You died. That, that nature that identity that was broken and severed that you've been holding on to for so long that Jesus died on the cross, was buried and raised again to crush it. And you walked through that death with him. Right? And because of that, your life is hidden with Christ and God. You're protected. You're secured who you are doesn't waver and doesn't change in God. There's nothing you need to do 
See, you died with Christ and you're hidden with him until the day he returns. Until the day you truly get to live, right? Without all the restraints of the world. Until the day that you truly get to be freed and live in your true design, walking in all fullness with God. But it's not enough just to set your heart on things above, right? Or to set your mind on things above. Because when we only do one, we leave room for negotiation. We've probably all heard it, right? Many of us have said it. Because this becomes the human element of this. You know, my mind says no, but my heart says yes. Let me tell you, as a father of four girls, that is the most frightening statement I could ever hear. Because, because why do you say that? When you say it, generally when you're in a relationship, when you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, when you know it's the wrong place, but it feels so right in the moment. Your daughter comes to you and goes, Dad, I know he's got red flags, but I think I love him. <laughs> and we walk in this, and we make our lives about this, and we're like, yes, the mind says no, and the heart says yes. And, God, and Paul's going, hey, guess what? You can't live with one and not the other. Because it goes in reverse also. I don't know about the rest of you. I live in this other element, right? Where the, the heart and the mind are just tearing at each other. Five, uh, two o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Sitting in your office. The sun's shining through the window. You're counting down the seconds. And you're like, man, I know I'm supposed to be here. But I'm pretty sure that golf course is looking really good right now. How about... No one's supposed to mow the lawn, but the brewers have a home game, so, right? We live in this element as humans, and we have this tendency to transition that into our relationship with God, where we relate to God in the same manner, right? And that's the challenge for the community surrounded Colossae, just like it's the challenge for us, because we all are looking for little ways to control who we are and what we do and how we relate to God. And each of these items that Paul's addressing, it's about self, right? It's all tied to that sin nature. It's not just a problem that was in Colossae, right? Paul writes the same message to the Galatians and to the Romans. And if we're honest, and if we're truthful, he'd probably write the same letter to us if he had a chance, right? Because our understanding God, of God is so impacted by our understanding of self and our understanding of culture. Some of us are still living in this way where, where Paul's saying, hey, you were buried and raised with Christ. And you're like, yeah, I, I know that. But hold on, Paul, because I just need to get out of this grave. And Paul's like, no, you don't get it. When God did this for you, when Christ did this for you, you're you don't need to be here. There's a ladder there. And you're like, yeah, Paul, I know there's a ladder there, but hold on, I'll climb out. I mean, it's a step. And you start to get halfway up and it gets overwhelming. The, the dirt starts to, to pull down and you start to fall and you get lower. And then you try to do it again. And slowly you start to bury yourself in this grave because you're so tied to seeing God through your own eyes. And it all starts off super simple, right? We all have a tendency to do it. We look and we go, God, I just need structure in my life. Um, so right now, I just need you to be the rules and regulations. I just need you to be there to tell me what to do and to set boundaries, and I'll take it from there. God, I've had a really tough week. Really tough week. I'm just feeling down. I'm feeling lost. I just need that spiritual high that I get on a Sunday morning. I just need to be here with you, and then I'll survive the rest of the week, and I can get it done. Right? God, society keeps telling me all these different rules of right and wrong. I just need you to tell me the rules. You tell me right and wrong, and I'll take it from there. God, I just, I just need you to listen to me for a second. I just need, I, I, really, I just need a counseling session, God. And, and I know that once I, once I tell you this, it's okay. I can, 
I can move forward. God, I've been, I've been studying this Bible. I've been reading all these things. I know all this stuff, and it's great to know everything about you. But that relinquishing part of me thing, not, I'm not ready for that just yet. And Paul says, listen, guys, all those things sound great, right? It's, it's great to be able to go to God when you need him to listen to you. But, but are you ready to release that to him? And it's great to be able to go to God and learn about him, but are you ready to submit to him? And it's great to go to God and to develop these rules and regulations, but are you so tied to them that you can't do what he needs you to do? Paul says, hey, it's not about those things. It never was. As long as we're looking to culture and self for measurement, we're lost in it. We're never going to be fulfilled. But if we're honest, that's, that's at the heart of what a lot of these questions are. God, I just, I kind of need to know where I'm at. We go to God like a teacher. Like, are you grading on the curve? Because if you're grading on the curve, I am awesome. Or, or is it, are, are we hardlined? Because do I need like an 80? And Paul's saying, guess what, guys? It's not what it's about. As long as you're focused on that, you're going to lose sight of everything else. Turn your heart to God. Turn your mind to God. See, Paul's calling us to remember that it didn't end with a death on the cross. It didn't end with a burial in a sealed tomb. If that were the case, we would need the rules and regulations. Right? If that were the case, we would need the checklist. If that were the case, we would need to regularly go to the waters for redemption. We're a broken creation. And in the garden, our pride and desire for more took over. And that pride and that effect, it's lasted on. But you know what didn't? Do you know what didn't? God's plan didn't change. God's plan wasn't broken in the garden. God's plan for salvation, for reconciliation, it didn't change. See, Jesus was sent as the one pure sacrifice. Gone are the days of seeking continual repentance. It was never enough. It was never going to be enough. Jesus' sacrifice was perfect. It was the ultimate sacrifice because Jesus didn't end, his story didn't end on the cross. Right? It didn't end at the tomb because on the third day, in that morning when the women went to prepare his body, that tomb was empty. Jesus overcame death and his believers we've overcome death also. We overcame it with him. Those chains that bound us, they've been broken, right? We are eternally forgiven. All, our salvation has no limits. So much of this control that we have is about going, hey God, I know that you say that you'll forgive anything, but really, um, I can't even forgive myself. So how are you going to forgive me? I just need to work through it. God, I... Did you even see what I did last night? I was weak. I was broken. I gave in to that temptation I shouldn't have. How can you even forgive me in that? I understand. Let me, I'll, let me fix this. But here's the deal, guys. Your salvation knows no limits. Paul says it doesn't matter, right? The same power that overcame the shackles of death, they were given to you. But sometimes we still get caught relaxing, right? Complacency starts to kick in. We lose sight of where we're at. And to that, Paul reminds us again, step out of the grave. There's nothing holding you there anymore, right? You don't belong there. You were raised with Christ. The grave, it doesn't have that power over you. Paul says, step away from your self-centered, self-focused identity because that person is dead. 
Our identity is now linked in Christ. So live like it. Pretty harsh words, right? But if we think about it, maybe not. Maybe those are the most loving words that Paul could have said. Because he looked at these people who are trying so hard to fix themselves and said, hey guys, you're already fixed. You're already free. Christ's death and burial and resurrection did for us what we were always working to achieve for ourselves. Right? It reset our design. That fall that separated us from God and sent us into this quest for self-gratification where we're always searching for filling ourselves and filling our holes. It broke. And Paul tells us that the search is over. We've been reunited with God and our new identity is rooted in that. When we do this, our relationship with God starts to set this new foundation of understanding of who we are. It starts to grant us value and we start to see value in other things. It adjusts our mindset for relationships and time. That sense of identity that was broken at the fall, it's now mended. But let's be honest, right? Paul recognizes it in his words. We still live in a fallen world. That sounds all fine and dandy when we're sitting in this room. We're like, yes, I can sit in that. I can do that. I can follow God through that. But we walk out the door, we're like, man... It's dark, and it's tough, and it's hard. And what Paul says is, hey, God-centered influences start to change that world. When we center ourselves on God, we become a beacon to the world around us. He shared this same message with the church in Corinth when he says, we are hard-pressed on every side. How many of us feel hard-pressed on every side? Sit there and you walk out and you're like, man, the world's fighting me. But guess what? We're not crushed. I'm perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life, life is at work in you. Life is at work in you. Christ's death, Christ's resurrection is at work in you. The pressures to keep up and be enough can destroy our sense of identity. But when you know who you are, when you know what you were created for, when you know where you're supposed to be and who you're supposed to be, things change. Because you were never designed to bear the weight of that burden. You were designed to live in community with God, to walk fully with God, to be validated by God, to find security in God. And we're called to act out of this identity in a way that shows the world God. This new life is a result. It's, it's not a starting point. So often we look and we want, we want that message from Paul to be, hey, um, Christ died and was resurrected, so you just need to continue to work so you can have a relationship with him later on. Just continue to put in the work, right? Just take the right steps, do the right things. You're all right. You'll catch up right? Paul's like, nah, it's not there. You were raised. You were buried. You were hidden. Guess what, guys? You don't have to put in the work because it was done for you, right? It's not, it's not a pathway to being close to God. This, this is who we are. Because when we're consistently focused on God with our heart and our mind, we become overcomers, right? We can be comforted because the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. When we place God at the center of our identity, when we set our hearts on things above, when we set our mind on things above and not on this earth, things happen. And a God-centered identity changes you from being influenced to being an influencer. 
And when we live life as an influencer, we change the world around us because we become the message of grace and peace, of mercy and truth, the only message that can fill the void that we have searched our whole life trying to fill. And we do this just as John writes, because since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Not no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. See, when we live a life with our hearts and minds focused on above, that completeness of God shines through. We become that beacon, and God s- starts to reach out and touch the community around us we act out of a God-centered identity, we begin to influence the culture around us. The darkness that has overcome them is overtaken by the love of God. So this picture we're putting up here, this is Patty Gosso. Patty is the head softball coach at the University of Oklahoma. She's been that since 1994. In 1994, Patty was the head, before taking over the realm at Oklahoma, she was a head coach at Long Beach City College in California, a school that shared their softball field with a beer league during the week. But somehow, Oklahoma thought it was the right thing to do to bring Patty across the country 1,300 miles, two time zones away, to head their women's softball program. So Patty, pregnant with his second son, moves across the country and starts to set up shop in Oklahoma, coaching their softball program. But soon they start to realize that there's no work for her husband. And they make the hard choice for him to move back to California because that's where coaching jobs were that he could use. And so for seasons at a time, Patty's left being a single mom, taking care of her family and coaching at the University of Oklahoma. After about a year and a half, starts to be whispers from alumni and players because they're not sure that they like Patty and what she's doing. Because Patty is open about her faith. She regularly holds Bible studies that are attended by players and other student athletes. And people start to question whether or not that's okay. Maybe her heart's not in softball, maybe it's somewhere else. And so in the midst of all this, Patty starts to go through this turmoil and goes, I'm without my husband, I'm raising kids on my own, and the world that I turn to is falling apart. And she starts to question, am I supposed to be here? And after discernment and prayer, um, and time with her husband, she's convinced, no, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is where God's called me because I'm supposed to be an influence beyond the field. And I just have to be comfortable in the fact that God's going to place me here for a reason, and I'll stay here. Fast forward 19 years. Patty Gosso now has the highest winning percentage of any coach in college softball ever. This past year, she just coached her seventh national championship. But guess what? In Patty's mind, that's, that's nothing. Because the promise that God provided that there was more, that she was there for more, that's the impact she's hoping for. And that's an impact that, amazingly enough, is shown through her softball program. So before, we're going to watch a video in a second, just, a little, just to set it up a little bit. This video was taken before the National Championship Series this year. And it's a little hard to hear the question at first, so let me just set, let you know. The question is by an ESPN reporter. And the ESPN reporter says, hey, um, you guys are on a 53-game winning streak. How do, you, how do you keep the joy of the game when you're doing that? Let's watch their response. 
Alex, start with ESPN for, for the players. I know you talk about keeping the joy of the game, but I'm curious. It's a long season, right? And you guys have had the target on your back the entire time, the win streak being number one. How do you handle the unique pressure that comes with that? How do you keep the joy for so long when anxiety seems like a thing that can very easily set in? Well, the only way that you can have a joy that doesn't fade away is from the Lord. And any other type of joy is actually happiness that comes from circumstances and outcomes. And um, I think Coach has said this before, but joy from the Lord is really the only thing that can keep you motivated, um, uh, just in a good mindset, uh, no matter the outcomes. Thankfully, we've had a lot of success this year, but if it was the other way around, uh, joy from the Lord is the only thing that can keep you embracing those memories, moments, friendships, and all of that. So uh, I would, that's really the only the only answer to that because there's no other way that softball can bring you that um, because of how much failure comes in it and just how much of a roller coaster the game can be. 1,000% agree with Grace Lyons. Um, I have went through that my freshman year. I... I was so happy to win the college, I've talked about this before, but I was just so happy that we won the College World Series, but I didn't feel joy. I didn't have, I didn't know what to do the next day. I didn't know what to do for that following week. I didn't feel filled, and I had to find Christ in that, and I think that is what makes our team so strong is that we're not afraid to lose because if it's not the end of the world if we do lose. Yes, obviously, we've worked our butts off to be here, and we want to win, but it's not the end of the world because our life is in Christ and that's all that matters. Yeah, um, I think a huge thing that we've really just latched onto is eyes up. And you guys see us doing this and pointing up, but we're really like fixing our eyes on Christ. And that's something where, like they were saying, you can't find a fulfillment in an outcome, whether it's good or bad. And um, I think that's why we're so steady in what we do and, and our love for each other and our love for the game because we know this game is giving us the opportunity to glorify God. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think once we figured that out and that was our purpose and everyone was all in with that, um, it's really changed so much for us. And I mean, I know myself, I, I've seen so much of a growth in myself with um, once I turned to Jesus and I realized how he had changed my outlook on life, not just softball, but understanding how much I have to live for, and that's living to exemplify the kingdom. And I think that brings so much freedom. And I'm sure everyone's story is similar, but we all have those great testimonies that have really like shown how awesome it is to play for something bigger. Um, and I think that's just what brings me so much joy. And no matter the outcome, whether we get a trophy in the end or not, we're, this isn't our home, and I think that's what's amazing about it is we have so much more. We have an eternity of joy with our Father, and I'm so excited about that. And yes, I live in the moment, but I know this isn't my home, and um, no matter what, my sisters in Christ will be there with me in the end um, when we're with our, our King. So. Patty, uh, you Probably could have just played that and we left early, right? <laughs> How amazing is that influence? A woman who sat there was like, am I supposed to be here? And God was like, no, you're supposed to be here. And yeah, you could put all the acclimates up, but that right there, I don't think that guy from ESPN knew what he was walking into. <laughs> because he says, where do you get joy? And he's like, hey, you don't understand joy. Joy is only achieved one place. We're in a search our entire life. I love the second, the second player to talk, and she goes, well, I won a national championship and didn't know what to do the next day. How many times in my life have we felt that? The highest of highs just to drop down and be like, I'm not filled. And Paul goes, hey, guys. <laughs> right? Does that feel? Right? That fulfillment, it's only found one place. And you don't have to do anything for it. Because he did it all. In God, our identity, our security, and our purpose are assured no matter what we face. Because today's big idea, a God-centered life changes lives. 
a life centered on God changes lives. If we're truly bed, dead and buried with Christ, then let's live like it, right? Let's rest in him because that's the ultimate goal. That's the race that we've set out to win, right? Because when Christ appears, guess what, guys? They said it there. We get to appear with him, not because we got lucky, not because we stumbled into the right place or, ah, you know, we picked the right religion, yay us. No. We appear with him because we are secured in him. Because his death and resurrection encompassed who we are. We're watching him, fixing our hearts on him, fixing our minds on him, focused completely on where he is and who he is. But that leaves a question, right? How do you respond to the reality of Christ's death and resurrection? Are you sitting here today going, man, Chris, that sounds like a great idea. Um, I, just, I, just, I just need to do a few things more on my own. Sounds great, Chris, but I'm just not sure about it yet. Guess what? You're never going to be able to achieve it on your own. We've been trying for centuries. We're broken. And the only thing that ever broke us was separation from God, and, and you don't have to be separated anymore. Because when we live a life focused on Christ, we, we live a life in tension, but we live a life focused on reflecting that, that togetherness of Christ, and that changes people. It's not just about stepping out of the grave as an individual, right? right we, if all we do is look to ourselves, it's not enough. It's not ever been about us, right? Look at Paul's words. Paul doesn't say, fix your heart on Christ, right? No, 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 no. Focus your hearts. I'm going to say, focus your mind on Christ. No, no, no. Focus your minds. See, this message is as much for the church today as it is for each of us as individuals. We died. We were buried. We were resurrected with Jesus, not simply for our own eternal benefit. As a community, we're a beacon. We're a beacon of hope in a time of despair when the world needs it more than anything. And when we live a life focused as an individual, when we live a life focused as a church, we change things. At Meadowbrook, I know, I know that's at the heart of who you are. Do you know how I know? It's kind of fun that this happened this week and I got to come up here because two years ago to this Sunday, right? I sat about eight rows back on the left side with Mary Beth, um, sat through two services because we were here interviewing for the position of executive director. Two years ago this week, Mary Beth and I walked into this building and nobody knew we were here except for the staff. And we looked at each other and said, wow, this feels like home. There's, there's something different here with these people. And as we sat through the service, we had, we had a couple sitting in front of us, and they turned around after service and introduced themselves. They said, are you guys new here? And we we're like, oh, if you only knew. <laughs> and we we're like, oh, you know, you know, we have to give the answer. We're, we're thinking about moving here. But we're not sure. We're kind of checking some things out, but we really wanted to make sure we found the right church if we do move here. Right? You kind of skirt. It was the truth. Do you know what their next statement was? It wasn't, oh, I hope the move goes well. It wasn't anything. They said, you are going to love Meadowbrook Church because this church is different. And, and you should really come back um, next week because we have a dinner for the youth group and you should volunteer and serve on that. <laughs> and I went, oh, you really don't know. <laughs> but, but here's the deal. That's at the heart of who we are as Meadowbrook Church, right? 
And what happens when we take that, that hospitality and that mentality, and we walk out these doors, and we are like that in our community, and we're like that in the world? What kind of difference does that do? How much of a difference does that make when we allow God to shine through us? Because Meadowbrook, we're called to change lives. We're equipped to change lives. Not because we want to. Not because we have our own power to, right? We're equipped to do it. We're called to do it because we died with Christ. We were buried with Christ. We were raised with Christ. And he grants us that power to do these things. Because that big idea, it's so much more. It's not an individual. Because a God-centered community changes lives. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that, uh, that you willingly did what we couldn't do. What we didn't know we needed, you provided. Father, I, uh, at times it's hard, and I get distracted, and the world starts to play on me, and Lord, I just, if there's things that, that I, have an indiv- as an individual, or us as a church, are holding back from you, Father, I pray you make it known to us so that we can fully and devotedly cast our heart and our minds towards you. <clears throat> because, Father, you... You are the only thing that will ever fulfill that thing that we're, that we're seeking. You are the only joy that is worth having. We pray these things in your name. Amen.